Good morning, everybody. It's so good to be gathering with you all this morning um, for our homes to, to celebrate Jesus, really, in the run-up to Christmas. My kids are literally beyond excited, um, and I can't believe it's only five days until Christmas now. Um, we've got a great morning planned this morning. Um, we're going to be having some worship from our worship band, um, and then Tom is going to be bringing us a, a Christmassy theme message this morning, um, which is going to be really good. So shall we pray, um, and then we'll do some um, worship together. Oh, Father God, I thank you, Jesus, that you, I thank you, Father, that you sent your precious son, Jesus, down to earth, Father, that we remember him, we remember that he was born at this time of year, God, as a precious gift to us. And Father, I just pray this morning that no matter where we're at, God, whether we're at home, whether, wherever we are, Jesus, that um, you will just meet with each and every one of us, God. Thank you that you meet us exactly where we are at, Father. We love you, Jesus. We just want to worship you this morning and lift your name high. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous! song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me for me it was in the garden Pray not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall it sins and my sorrows he made them his very own he bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone how marvelous Shall ever be how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever the 
ransomed in glory His face I at last shall see T'will be my joy through the ages To sing of His love for me
so much to the worship band um you know these guys have spent hours recording um for these things over this christmas season so i just want to say a massive thank you to them all oh, that was absolutely beautiful um, and it was so good to just worship together this morning um so i've got a few notices to share this morning um just the first one is obviously christmas day is on friday and we are going to be having a short christmas service together online on facebook at 10 a.m um, it's going to last about 10-15 minutes and um, we'll kind of do a worship song together, we'll hear a little Christmas message um, and you're so welcome to join us at, join with us for that but it'll be a slightly earlier time at 10am so make sure you tune in at the right time. Um, following this we're going to have a Zoom um, kind of chat um, where we can just wish each other a Merry Christmas um, and some of the kids will probably want to show off um, one or two of their toys as well and you're so welcome to join us for that. Um, if you do want to join us for that and you're not part of our regular kind of emails that we send out for a church as a church, um, if you just message us um, either on our Facebook page or if you go to the Hope Church Bedlam website um, then there's an um, email address that you can email on there um, and we'll send you the Zoom link for that as well to join us. To join with us for that zoom chat as well that'll probably again be just 10 15 minutes but it'll just be such a lovely opportunity to just wish each other a merry christmas um on christmas morning on Sunday the 27th of December, we're not going to be having an online service that day. And um, this is just to give everybody who serves on the teams just um, a break really over the Christmas season. Um, but we'll be back on Sunday the 3rd of January where we will be doing an in-person meeting. So we'll be meeting at East Bedlam Community Centre at 10.30am and I'm so looking forward to this. Um, it'll be a COVID secure meeting Um, there'll be kids work which to separate downstairs um, and we'll be sending some emails out over the kind of next week or two and um, just telling you what time to arrive for that. If you'd like to come to that um, and you're not normally part of our kind of church community and um, if you just again drop us a message or an email and um, just so we can give you a few more details just so we can make sure that that is a COVID secure event and um, that would be brilliant. 
Um, and just to say as well, after the service today, our younger kids work are going to be meeting online. Again, if you've got younger children, so under the age of eight, and they would like to be a part of this, again, drop us a message or an email and we will send you the Zoom link for that. Um, the older kids aren't going to be meeting today, um, but they will be back on the 3rd of, the 3rd of January for our in-person meeting together. Okay, well, we're going to ha um, play a short video now, and then after that, I'm going to hand over to Tom, who's going to share a Christmassy message with us this morning. Thank you. They say there's a big man who lives far away, supposedly jolly, but it's hard to say. I've never seen him and neither have you. But the children believe, and I suppose that'll do. He's known as a loner with many a quirk, no time for a chat, he's embroiled in his work. He keeps to himself for most of the year. I reckon we're grateful he doesn't appear. We send him requests for particular needs, but we never hear back, who knows if he heeds. We try to be good, give his arm a twist, to merit our place on his blessed little list. And maybe one day, if we do what we should, he'll give us our things just so long as we're good. <laughs> I've had it to hear, I'm calling his bluff, he's a weird, moralistic dispenser of stuff! Granted, this rant is a strange one to pick, but listen, I'm not really after St Nick. As strange as he is, and Santa is odd, I'm really addressing most folks' view of God. It's God who we see as some distant big guy, some ancient invisible St Nick in the sky. He sees you asleep, he knows when you wake, he's watching and waiting to spot your mistake. And just like with Santa, requests we hand in. We want all his things, but we don't want him. That's our connection with Old Father Christmas. We might dress it up, it's essentially business. Throughout the year, good behaviour's our onus. When Christmas rolls around, we're expecting our bonus. Just leave us our gifts, Nick, we've been good enough. And then please push on, now we've got all your stuff. I mean, Santa is interesting, curious, quirky, but nobody wants him to share their turkey. I'm sure his ho-ho-hos are sublime, but I fear what he'll say once he's drunk our mulled wine. That's old St Nick, but the picture rings true. It's how we imagine what God is like too. But Christmas resounds with a stunning not so. The one from on high was born down below. To a world in need, he did not send another. God the Son became God our brother. He drew alongside forever to dwell. Our God in the flesh, Emmanuel. This God in the manger upends all our notions. A heavenly stooping, divine demotion. Born in a stable, wriggling on straw, fully committed to life in the raw. Santa gives things and then goes away. Jesus shows up to befriend and to stay. Santa rewards those for good behavior. Jesus draws near to the broken as savior. If you don't like God, I think I know why. You probably think he's St. Nick in the sky. You're right to reject that faraway stranger. This Christmas, look down to the God in the manger. Good morning, everyone. Um, a great sort of fun little clip, little poem there, but um, also of a really serious message. It's really good to be with you this morning. Uh, my name's Tom. I, I think Helen introduced me. I'm one of the leaders here at Hope Church. And um, and it's a funny old morning, isn't it? On the dawn after the announcement, um, the, the newspapers are leading with headlines that Christmas is cancelled. And um, we'll get into that in a bit. But I want to read. I want to start today by reading from Isaiah. Um, I want to read from chapter nine quite a familiar few verses at least one of the verses will probably be very familiar to you but we're going to read this together so get your bibles out open up um, Isaiah chapter nine and we're going to read verses one to seven together this morning as a way of starting and this is a prophecy this is a word spoken about the coming of Jesus but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of of Naphtali but in the latter time he was made glorious the way of the sea the land beyond the Jordan Galilee of the nations the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness on them light has shone you have multiplied the nation you have increased its joy 
they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. As they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I want to start this morning by talking to you about Father Christmas, <laughs> about Santa Claus. It's funny, isn't it, to read this prophecy of hope, of, um, of transformation, of restoration, and to start talking about Father Christmas. But, you know, in a, in a holiday season where there is so much mysticism and symbolism and tradition and folklore and even actual legislation, you know, we think there was some legislation about this Christmas. There has always been legislation about the Christmas holiday for hundreds and hundreds of years. But one symbol, one mythical figure has always stood out for me since my childhood. And I wonder if he stood out for you, too. He is Father Christmas or Santa Claus, you know, who, while they were initially kind of separate traditions, um, with Father Christmas being very much the European stay at home name for this uh, personification of Christmas. Santa came over the seas from the Americas, um, but they are really these days one and the same. And he has many origins. And at least for the, the Western world, he has possibly become one of the most recognisable faces of the season. And part of his origin story, if not the, well, I think it's the fundamental part of his origin story is found in Saint Nicholas. A man born just uh, shy of 300 years after Jesus died. And Joe and my wife, um, sorry, J myself and my wife, Joe, we have always um, focused on this part of the origin story of Father Christmas with our children. They should be able to tell you this story fairly, fairly well. You know, any kids actually will tell you some facts about Santa, right? It, he comes from the North Pole. He gets around the world in one night. He flies. He has reindeer. He gives gifts. He squeezes down the chimney. But his actual origin story, the one, um, the one of St. Nicholas, is possibly even more fantastic and more magical than these Father Christmas or Santa attributes that we're so familiar with. Firstly, he did not look like a modern day Santa. That wasn't him. Actually, his remains um, are kept in a crypt in Barry in Italy, and he was a Greek bishop. And using his remains and what we know about the time, a pretty accurate photo fit has been made of old Saint Nick. Here you can see there's a programme you can watch, a documentary on this, mate, the real face of Santa. So here he is for you to see. You know, they even though he had a badly broken nose due to his treatment in prison by the Romans. So they've got a good picture of him there. He seems to actually have been quite an extraordinary Christian. He defied the orders to renounce Christianity by the Roman Empire. And he was actually a fiery, fiery fawn in the Roman side. They aided this guy. He lived um, as a bishop in a small town in Turkey. And he spent many years in prison before finally being set free when Christianity was finally accepted uh, is during the Constantine reign. When Constantine, the Emperor Constantine decided that Christianity was accepted and in fact made it the religion of Rome. He died on the 6th of December. We know the day, but we don't know the exact date. We don't know what year, around the mid uh, fourth century. So many miracles and so many generous acts were associated with this man were uh, done in his name, that his fame continued to live on and the stories have been told for generations and generations. By the 12th century, he was the patron saint of children and a gift bringer. And these were, there was two main stories that really stood out and were told very religiously almost like fables in fact um these are quite gory and remarkable stories as to why he was made the patron saint of children you might have heard one i certainly knew this one um and it's the one where he saves three young girls from prostitution by secretly delivering bags of gold to their father's creditor probably at night 
But there's another story, and this one is really gory. He sensed, the story goes, he sensed that a man was up to no good. You know, he sees you when you're naughty, he knows when you're awake. And he enters the, um, the innkeeper's house, this man was an innkeeper, at night. Not only sensing the crime, but also sensing the victims too. And in the basement, he found three young boys' bodies. Uh, they were dismembered bodies and they were pickling in barrels. You know, not only did he catch the perpetrator of the crime, so the story goes, he also saw those three dismembered young boys resurrected. And the fame and his fame from this story grew and grew and rose and rose. And these stories have been told for generations. You know, if we fast forward to the medieval period, the fables of St. Nick started to um, take on some European gods attributes as well. Some of the pagan gods. You know, there was one God who appeared to children as a bearded man. There was another who had the power of flight and they were put together with this patron saint, um, the gift bringer, St. Nicholas. And this was done, we think, to st or likely to as a way of policing uh, children and enforcing good behaviour, making sure the kids said their prayers and were well behaved. After the Reformation, of course, we stopped celebrating the saints. People still wanted to give gifts. They wanted to love their family and their children. And so it was around this time that we find the celebration of the birth of Jesus was amalgamated with the, the Christmas tradition. But as one commentator put it, you know, Jesus wasn't really scary. Baby Jesus wasn't scary enough to get the kids to behave. And so many of these scary Germanic figures that we can look back on um, that are associated with Christmas and Jesus' birthday are loosely based on St. Nick too, but they're almost made like the sidekick to Christmas. Um, to, to again, the behavior enforces, you know, Rao Claus, which is rough Nicholas, Ashenta Claus, which is Ashley Nicholas, or Pell's Nickel, Fury Nicholas. They all used a mixture of gift giving and consequences for bad behavior. The consequences were like whipping or kidnapping, pretty horrific. And you can see, kind of see how we start to get the picture of Christmas and Father Christmas that we have today. And some people, particularly the Dutch, actually, they just refused to give up on Santa Claus. They were not going to let go of this uh, mystical man, this personification of Christmas. And he traveled with them to the Americas. And this is where Santa Claus was resurrected. But for the rest of Europe and the New Americas, actually, they'd already adopted this outdoor celebration, uh, Saturnalia. And it was an outdoor romp, which is kind of where the Christmas tree stuff comes from, of alcohol and dancing and... Um, you can kind of see where this start, side of Christmas comes in too. And for a while, it just seemed like the legend of St. Nick might die off. But, you know, the good old Dutch and then, and then comes in the 19th century and there was a concerted effort, particularly driven by the poets. You know, we should never underestimate the arts and the ability to influence our culture. And they um, wanted to make a, this, bring this all together to celebrate the family. And they brought back St. Nick from the brink. It was like St. Nick mark two so here's the real face of santa the next slide is um the the santa of the 1800s so images and stories of a pipe smoking flying santa started to make the headlines throughout the 19th century and it was in uh, 1822 when clement clark moore wrote a visit from saint nicholas now you probably know this as the night before christmas and he wrote it for his six children he had no intention of um adding to this increasing furore around Santa Claus, but it was actually published a year later and is perhaps one of the biggest influences since St. Nicholas himself. You know, and those grim tales were softened. Those, um, those tales of um, Pelznickel and the like were softened and reversed into what we have today. Some people, you know, they put Father Christmas on their naughty list. You know, there's many Christians I've met that kind of want to separate themselves from this. He's a symbol of consumerism, they say. Christmas is, you know, Jesus's birthday, they say, and he takes away the attention from Jesus. And then on the other side, you have people that fully buy into the fantasy that um, they have Father Christmas stories. They, um, they're desperate to preserve this image of Father Christmas as a real magical gift bringer. They have the tree and the Christ Christmas Eve becomes a magical fairy tale that the family takes part in. And anyone who might put this fantasy at risk, they attack. You know, that video we showed before has a, a warning that is attached to it. That is, it kind of insinuates that Father Christmas might just not be real. <laughs> hmm. 
And this is the kind of thing that these people will attack. My children must believe in the magic they cry at all costs. You know, and I want to tell you, I tell you all of this because firstly, I want you to know that I love Christmas. I believe it's a magical time that, you know, in our family, we really love it. But I also tell you all this because there's often this battle of ownership for Christmas. And I think it's a distraction. You know, is it really Jesus's birthday? Is it really a pagan festival? Is it really all about tradition? Is Father Christmas real? Is it about St. Nicholas? Well, yeah, you know, it is about all of those things. Christmas is about gifts. Christmas is about St. Nick himself. And my tip, by the way, is to focus on those things with the children, particularly the origin story of St. Nick as a gift bringer for kids. Christmas is about merriment. We saw it, didn't we? It's about family. It's about celebration. These are the things that were all brought together and they are so important. And you know what? When they're not given the ultimate status, when we don't have Christmas as the ultimate thing or one of the things of Christmas as the ultimate thing, well, we can enjoy them without living for them. And we can use them, in fact, to point to Jesus and we can use them to realign our hearts and the hearts of others with Jesus, regardless of whether we believe that this is actually Jesus's birthday or not, or regardless of whether we believe in the ownership of Christmas. You know, yesterday, Boris Johnson, he delivered that dreaded announcement, didn't he? Christmas is cancelled. Now, he didn't quite put it like that, but that was the first headline I read. Um, it was led by the I newspaper and it said Christmas is cancelled. Overnighters banned, mixing banned on Christmas Day, except for the three households, unless you're in London, I think, or the South East or the East, and then you can't do that either. I think. Check the rules out. The furore as people rushed out of London, no spaces on trains, social distancing out the window, traffic jams on the motorways. You know, that announcement was tough, tough to take. There were some tears in our household as we had to cancel our plans. And some of those things that we rightly enjoy, times with family, with our friends, time to let your hair down, time for good food, time for Father Christmas to bring his presence, time to worship in person with our church family. You know, we're quite rightly disappointed and we feel let down this year. It's been a tough year, hasn't it? And yes, listen, everything is relative. Some have relatively struggled so much more than others. Some have, you know, had complete isolation, complete loneliness, loss of health, loss of loved ones. Some have had extra hard work and pressure heaped upon the top of them. Some of them have lost, some people have lost income. For many of us though, this is, while these things have seemed close, for many of us, the reality of this period has been one of anxiety and boredom. And maybe that's why we feel so let down this year. And so probably it's felt like a real blow. And so in the light of this blow, I want us to turn again to Jesus, regardless of the season. I want us to know and to remember and to hope again. Let's turn our hope to Jesus. We read in Isaiah 9, I'm sure you're familiar with those words, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Sometimes we forget that this prophecy, this word was delivered into very, very tough times. This, this word was delivered into a dark time where things look bleak. It was actually delivered before the Babylonian exile, before they were conquered. You know, people were afraid, though, because they were being pressed on all sides. They didn't know who to turn to. There was some uh, negotiations, political negotiations going on, and, and they were scared. They were losing control on all, all sides. And this is where this word was given. Two chapters before this, there was a, a word prophesied from Isaiah as well, as therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call him Emmanuel. You know, as we read these words, we see Jesus. We know Jesus. They didn't know God fully revealed yet. They were just words. As Isaiah delivered them, there was just a glimmer of hope in Emmanuel, God with us. What could that mean? What could that mean? What could that look like? Just the hope of this man or God coming, whose names, as we read, could only really be attributed to God. They could only, these names that we read here could only be given to God. A child is born. A son is given. This is a person. This is a human the almighty God, the everlasting, limiting himself, condensing himself down, down to a child. 
giving humanity a free gift. You know, we think of gifts at Christmas. This is the present under the tree that you've been waiting for and it's freely given. The government will be on his shoulder. In a time of conspiracy theories, in a time of economic crashes, in a time of dodgy government decisions, well, all of these things will be on the shoulders of Jesus. They will submit to him. They are starting to submit to him. This is good news this morning because we know what kind of leader Jesus is. What kind of leader is he? Well, he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Ah, oh, we will be full of wonder. God and man, the son of God, a baby and a saviour. Even the angels are in wonder of Jesus. And he is the counsellor. When we seek counsel, let's start with Jesus. We can be tempted to think of therapy here in, the, in our modern context. But we are talking about intimate and ultimate advice and wisdom. The wisdom of the father. And we have a direct line in our wonderful counsellor today. And he will be called mighty God. He is mighty, mighty to save. Jesus is God and he has power over all things. Not only does he have the wisdom, the wonderful counsel, he is also mighty. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Mighty Jesus, mighty God. He has the power to go through death and conquer it and save us all. Mighty God. And he'll be called everlasting father. Jesus is one with the Father, and as such, he is everlasting Father. He is the Father as well of the world to come, the world our hope is in, when all things will be made new. Through Jesus, we have family. I love this. I've got a pretty big family, and I really love my fantastic family. But it's just a poor reflection. It's just a poor reflection of what is to come. This Christmas time, when we celebrate family, let's celebrate our family too, that is found in Jesus. And it's a family that will not die. It's a family that cannot be separated. He is our everlasting father. And he will be the prince of peace. As a king, he preserves the peace. He commands the peace. He creates the peace. When there's warring worlds, where there's war raging on our health, like cancer attacking the body or a deadly virus threatening the whole population, where there's bitter disagreements, where there are peoples or ethnicities fractioned and full of bitterness and hatred, Jesus is bringing and commanding and creating peace. This can start in our hearts right now. Anyone who has Jesus as their king, peace reigns. He's the prince of peace. And he's not just a peaceable person. He's not a big softy. He's not just someone who tries to keep the peace. He's a king who reigns with peace. He creates peace. And it's on, it's him who the government will be on. An everlasting government that is being established. One of great wisdom, mighty power, intimate family and reigning peace. And this government has been established and is being established. This government is increasing, it is an increasing government. And one day this government will reign over all. No longer decisions just for the greater good. Or even worse, no longer decisions made for the rich and ruling elite. No longer decisions to maintain the status quo. No longer decisions to keep those working class down. <laughs> no longer will we have these things oppressed upon us because no, we have a new ruler and his name is Jesus. This is what it means for Emmanuel, God with us. Israel, they dreamed of the moment that we have. After this moment for them, things got physically worse. Temple destroyed, God's house. This was the dream for them to have God living amongst them. And he was housed in a temple and it got destroyed. And let's be honest, I don't think they had grasped this prophecy yet. They thought that it meant someone would physically come and save them and they would rule as a nation. They would, a nation would be established just like every other nation. They didn't realise that this kingdom would come differently. They didn't realise that they needed a spiritual saviour as well as a physical savior. And so things kept getting worse. Things like this virus and the subsequent lockdown and the loss of important, even beautiful things. It's not new. It's not new to God. It's not new to the people of God, but neither is hope. Hope is not a new thing either. Neither is joy in the suffering. Jesus Christ 
is our deliverance. He's our deliverance from death. He's our deliverance from a lockdown Christmas. He's our deliverance from loneliness. Jesus Christ, this Christmas, in the middle of beautiful and important traditions that might be missing, Jesus isn't missing. Jesus is here and he's with us today. You might be missing the family today. I don't know. You might be worried about what Christmas looks like ne next week. Well, Jesus is your everlasting father. We will call him everlasting father. You're missing friends and merriment. Well, Jesus is also a father who will never leave you. He is with you. You might be missing gifts this Christmas. Maybe you can't get your gifts to someone or from someone. Jesus is the gift freely given to you. You might feel alone. All alone. Jesus is Emmanuel. God with us. And the confidence we have is that the government, it will be on his shoulder. So we will call him wonderful counsellor. In fact, let's start again. We call him, we do call him wonderful counsellor. We call him mighty God. We call him everlasting father. And we call him prince of peace. I want to wish you a wonderful, wonderful Jesus-centred Christmas. Amen. Over to you, Helen. Wow, such a powerful message that was. And, you know, we can know hope and peace because of Jesus. You know, Jesus is here. He is with us today. He is Emmanuel. Amen to that. And can I just encourage you, if anything that Tom has said today has just stirred something in your heart, please do um, drop us a message um, or email us at um, Hope Church Bedlinton, um, and we'd love to have a chat with you about that um, over the Christmas season as well. Thanks so much for that, Tom. Um, that was brilliant. I'm just going to end this morning with um, a Christmas blessing. Um, this is just something that I kind of read the other day, um, and I just want to share it with you today as we end the meeting. Dear Lord... We thank you for being here with us as we celebrate this cherished holiday to honour your precious sacred birth. We recognise and acknowledge that all the material pleasures we enjoy over this season, the food, the gifts and everything else come from you, Lord, through your grace, your compassion and your love for us. Help us throughout this year to always try to be worthy of all the blessings that you have given us, our family, our friends, our comforts, by living our lives in your will according to your holy word. We pray that you will bless each and every person and their families joining with us this morning. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. Have a wonderful Christmas um, and just God bless to you all. Um, and maybe hopefully we'll see some of you online at 10 o'clock on Christmas Day as well. Much love. God bless. Bye.